I want to share a little bit of good news this morning with everyone. Um, I was not mauled by a bear yesterday. Um, and in fact, I'm going to go so far as to say that uh, of everyone on the Zoom today, none of us were mauled by a bear yesterday. Uh, and I'll go even one step further. I'm going to place a little bet here, and I'd like you to just give me a big thumbs up on camera if I'm right about this, uh, that until I said that, none of us had even thought about the fact that we were not mauled by bears yesterday. Yeah, I'm seeing the thumbs up. Yeah, because I hadn't thought about it either uh, until I got uh, the daily email. I got a daily email from the author Seth Godin. And yesterday's email started out by pointing out to me and to everyone else who received the email that uh, none of us, in fact, have been mauled by bears recently. Uh, and he goes on to talk about what we think of as civilization. What does that word civilization mean? He says it amounts to a layer of insulation between us and the many dangers of the world. Right? So civilization insulates us from wild animals. Civilization means that when I get thirsty, I can go to the sink and I can pour myself a glass of water and I don't have to think about dysentery or cholera or all the other many things that a person could conceivably become sick with from drinking untreated water. Um, it means that I have clothes on my back and shoes on my feet and a roof over my head. And delivery trucks driving by outside my window. But it also means that when this insulation that civilization provides us with is not equally available, when the insulation is applied unevenly to a society, that's privilege. And privilege is a term that gets thrown around a lot. We talk about white privilege, we talk about male privilege, um, and it's sometimes hard to know like, what exactly is meant by that. And I was struck by both the simplicity and the clarity of Seth's description here. Privilege is that I am insulated from some dangers that others are not insulated from. And even if we stick with that basic example of safe drinking water, most Americans are insulated in a way that large portions of the developing world are not, right? And that makes us privileged. And privilege is something interesting to think about in the description of Moshe that we get in this morning's parasha. Uh, because in the passage that we read this morning, the Torah tells us, "Vehaish Moshe anav meod mikol adam asher alpneha adama," that this man, this person, Moses, was the most humble of all human beings on the face of the earth. Um, and that word "humble" is is always a little bit of a sticking point for me, because right? whatever the Hebrew "anav" means. Um, it doesn't mean humble in the sense of being quiet or meek or reserved, because the man that we're talking about is the leader of the Jewish people. In the very same passage, not only does the Torah describe Moshe as the most humble human being on the face of the earth, but God describes Moshe as the greatest of all of the prophets, the only prophet to receive conscious revelation instead of dreamlike revelation, the only prophet to interact with God face to face, not in some kind of a secondary way. And if we think back further to Moshe, Moshe is a person who was willing to take on the most powerful political leader in the world to stand up to a power structure that he thought was evil and unjust at great personal risk to himself.
and Moshe is privileged. Um, again, give me a thumbs up if you remember the movie, The Prince of Egypt. People have, people have seen the movie? Yeah. If you haven't seen the movie, see the movie. My kids love it. We watch it a lot. Um, there's a lot that the movie gets right about the Exodus story, even though it's not a literal word for word retelling of the Torah. Uh, and, and one of the things that the story gets most right, which I think we don't pay enough attention to when we're watching the movie, watch the very, very, very early scenes when Moshe is still living as a prince in the, in the Pharaoh's palace, and he doesn't yet know his true identity as an Israelite, or he hasn't accepted it for himself. He's a spoiled brat. I mean, it's brilliant in the movie, right? He gets up to all kinds of mischief. He's constantly making trouble. He doesn't see himself as accountable to anyone for anything. That Moshe is the very definition of privilege. And I was th I've been thinking about this all week uh, because we took our kids last Saturday down to the parkway. We went to the protest march that started at Aiken's Oval and moved down towards City Hall. And I was struck in particular by one sign that I saw someone carrying by that defined privilege. The sign said, privilege is when you think something isn't a problem, because it's not a problem for you. Privilege is when you think something is not a problem because it's not a problem for you. I can drink water all day long in my house and I never have to worry about it. I can walk down the street at any hour of the day or night and if I see a police officer, I smile and wave. There are problems in this world that are not my problems personally. Jordan, you spoke earlier about the importance of structure in your life. And um, I, I held back because I didn't want to influence or shape the course of things. But now that your Devar Torah is done and we've heard it, I can tell you uh, that I really deeply related to that part of your Devar Torah. Um, its structure is personally very important for me too. It's part of the choices I've made to live a life defined by Jewish observance. Um, it's part of what's been so hard for me in this time of coronavirus when I'm not getting up and going into the office and sitting in meetings and going, doing my work and coming home and the regular rhythms of daily minion and Shabbat services and everything's been disrupted. I really felt for what you said. And I've been inspired by your grace in pivoting into this new time and to show up here and to own this Zoom service as your bat mitzvah, right? And to just, I'm, I mean, just the way you just smiled says it all. Uh, this is you and it's beautiful to see how you looked at this and you said, well, plan A wasn't gonna happen and let's dive into plan B. And I think there's a third dimension to this conversation about structure, right? There are the structures that sustain us. There are the ways that we build new structure when those other structures have been disrupted. And there's the third dimension of structure that we learn from the character of Moshe, which is that sometimes there are structures that serve their purpose that accomplish good and perhaps accomplish a great deal of good and sometimes accomplish a great deal of good for a large number of people. And at the same time, those structures are deeply fundamentally unjust to other people. 
And so there's a time when we are called to challenge those structures, to dismantle the structures, to demand change in the structure. Right? As Seth Godin wrote yesterday, We've done a shameful job of offering insulation to far too many people. Access to healthcare, clean water, good schools, freedom from fear of state violence, and the benefit of the doubt, which is easy to overlook, because it all adds up every day for generations. And I've, I've struggled really facing that, not only because I am insulated from so many of these problems, but because honestly the status quo three months ago, six months ago, six years ago, was really quite good for me. I had good schools for my kids to go to. I had choices of good schools for my kids to go to. I have a comfortable house. There's food on the table. There's water, clean water that comes out of the sink. And we can no longer afford to ignore that those things are not true for every person in our country. They're not true for the black community. They're not true for rural communities. They're not true for the impact that the coronavirus has had on the indigenous people of this country. And what Moshe wants us to understand in his transition from spoiled prince to leader is what it means to look beyond our own experience and our own interest to ask the question, who doesn't have a coat on their back? Who isn't insulated from the dangers of the world? And if there, and if there is any person who's an answer to that question, the next question that Moshe wants us to ask is, what do I do about it? Because there's something really interesting about this anava that our parasha attributes to Moshe. Right? The, the English word humble doesn't capture it. Because this English word humble suggests a reticence. It suggests a quietness that Moshe doesn't actually exhibit. Because Moshe is someone who steps forward, because Moshe is someone who takes action, revolutionary action, against injustice. So I'd like to suggest that Anava is about taking action, that Anava is about stepping forward, Anava is about recognizing that we are the person. And as I mentioned a couple of times earlier this week, uh, there's a, a verse in the famous scene where Moshe uh, kills the Egyptian taskmaster in order to defend the Israelite slave who's being beaten. Um, before it happens, it says, Vayifen kova kova yarkien ish, that Moshe turned this way and that, and he didn't see anybody. And when we read this, the verse seems to suggest that Moshe is looking around to say, is anybody going to see me? Am I going to get caught if I do this? But the Midrash suggests something else altogether. When it says, Vayarki ein ish, he saw that there was no person. The Moshe looked around, wondering who was going to do something about this injustice that was in front of him. Who's going to stop this cruelty from happening? Who's going to stop the violence from happening? 
and he looks everywhere and he doesn't see anyone who's willing to do it. And that's the moment of awakening for Moshe. That's the moment when he understands that he has a choice. That he has a choice to oppose injustice or to participate in it. But it's no longer possible to be a bystander when there's a slave being beaten in front of you. It's no longer possible to remain neutral when there's a slave being beaten in front of you. And that is the end of Moshe's privilege. In a very significant way, in the sense that the consequences of his defending the slave against the structure of injustice is that he is stripped of his rank and stripped of his privilege and stripped of his place in the, in the palace. He's sent into exile. He's alone. And then he finds community in the family of Yitro, his father-in-law. Yitro, who respects Moshe's concern for the vulnerable, who sees in Moshe the qualities of a good shepherd that he wants for his flock, the qualities of a devoted husband that he would want for his daughter. And when God calls Moshe back to Egypt, when God tells Moshe that the work is not done, and Moshe goes to Yitro and says, I have to go back. I can't stay here safe when my people are in peril. Yitro says to Moshe, Lech le shalom, go toward peace. Be protected on your way. Yitro understands and he gives Moshe this bracha that's not just a manner of speaking, but is, is a real bracha, it's armor, it's insulation. Wrap yourself in peace because you're going into danger. And as the as the streets calm down in Philadelphia, I think Moshe would want us to keep turmoil in our hearts. Because the work isn't over. The journey isn't over. And the quality of anava that Moshe represents asks of us to see our privilege, to ask the questions, what are the problems in the world that aren't problems for me, but are problems of justice? And then to turn our attention to the work, the individual work, the communal work, the work of allyship that it's going to take to set things right. Because if the insulation from danger that civilization offers us is unevenly applied, it's privilege. And when we are living in a state of privilege, we have only two choices. We can allow that privilege to blind us to the needs of others, or we can use that privilege to live as part of the solution. Shabbat Shalom.